The gospel of Jesus Christ is not the message of accusation or condemnation and guilt that destroys your life. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not about how much you must serve God or what you must do for God. No, the gospel of Jesus is the message of how He serves us with His love and how He loves us unto freedom where we can dwell in freedom. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the message of God's eternal acceptance of His people where in creation waits for people to know that they are not nothing but loved and embraced by Jesus Christ. The gospel is the gospel of His grace. And that is why we are living by grace. Witness of what? Witness of His physical resurrection. And we declare unto you glad tidings or good news or the gospel, how that the promise which was made unto our fathers, God has fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he has raised Jesus again, and it is all, as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, this day have I begotten thee. Okay, now, when was Jesus begotten? When was the Son of God born? When was Jesus declared or begotten of God? Right there, when he was raised from the dead. So we find Jesus being made of Mary, but in order for his physical body to be born of God, he had to be raised from the dead. He had to be raised out of corruption into incorruptible human flesh. And that was not done by Mary. It was not done by any physical uh, genealogy or anything. It came forth by the Spirit of God or the very breath of God, or the very life of God. So when the life of God gave life to his body, and his body was not made from Mary, but his physical body was brought to a place where it was born of God above death, and above the sin it took upon it, then we say this physical body is now born from God or begotten of God. We need to understand that. That's very clear. Now you might say, and you might have a question, say, but wasn't God the father of Jesus because Joseph wasn't the father? I do believe that God, and the reason why that is, is why there was a virgin birth, is because Jesus was the last Adam. Adam was taken from the dust of the earth. Who was the physical father of uh, uh, Adam? God made him. God made him from what? From the dust of the earth. God made Adam. But Adam, after he was made, still had to be born of the tree of life. He still had to eat of the tree of life. So when this Adam fell, God came and created the lost Adam. And how did he make him? He made him from the dust of the earth, and the, God was the creator which made him of this physical genealogy, the dust of the earth. That's how I see that. Yet this lost Adam had to eat of the tree of life and had to be born of that tree, born out of the death he was in, into this incorruptibility. And that, we find, took place in the resurrection. Amen. That's why the scripture says, and we're going to read this again. Let's read from verse 30. But God raised him from the dead. This is Acts 13, 30. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee. What does is, what is the writer of, of Acts try to look, try to portray here, listen, this was a physical resurrection. That's why he says they were, he was seen many days. It wasn't, we all know a vision, a vision you see today and then it's gone. You don't see it again. If you, 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 you don't find 
uh, repetitive vision here. You don't find the same vision being seen by so many people over and over. You're finding that Luke is trying to say uh, in his writing here, and Paul is trying to teach, that this resurrection was a physical resurrection wherein Jesus was born from the dead or born out of or away from death by the Spirit of God. And he goes on and he says that many people see, saw him, many. So there's no doubt that this was a birth. In other words, uh, uh, he was dead and then he came alive. It's almost like a child. Uh, if the people decide we're going to have a child, they don't. The, the wife has got nothing in her womb, nothing. There's just nothing. There's death in her womb, basically, if you want to call it like that. There's no child. But then, once the sperm and the egg comes together, what happens? Then a child is formed, and that child comes to life out of that almost, here what I'm trying to say, empty womb. There was no life, now life comes. In the very same way, Jesus went into the grave, there was no life, and now life came. So he was born again. This time his body was not born of Mary. He got the body from Mary, but the life in this body is now born again, but this time it's born of the Spirit, born of God, having no fleshly influence into it, yet it is a physical body. But it is above corruption. It doesn't have any sin in it. Amen. Now you might say, but does that mean the physical body of Jesus had sin and so forth? The physical body of Jesus could die. That's why Jesus died. If Jesus came as an incorruptible, you couldn't kill him on the cross, or he couldn't die upon the cross. He couldn't give up his life. It would be impossible. He had to become mortal. He had to become man. And we, we need to understand that he had to be created as a man. A man had to, flesh had to be prepared. Now, let us get back to the point. There's so much, and, and that's why I'm going to speak for this for weeks. Uh, touching all the points. But this is a point I want to make. Jesus was seen of many people, it was a physical resurrection. And he was and, and, and we declare unto you glad tidings how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God fulfilled that same unto us, their children. So what was the promise that God made? It was that which was fulfilled, which was what? In that he raised Jesus again as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, this day have I begotten you. So he is saying that the resurrection of Jesus is basically the fulfillment, or as it was said in the second psalm, you are my son, this day have I begotten you. You read in Isaiah 9, it says that a child was born, but a son was given. You see, what God has come to give unto us is a glorified physical human being that has no sin, that has no death. That's what he gives unto us for. That is what we need. Why? Because we are in our bodies unglorified, undignified. Uh, we are in our physical bodies dying full of sin. So what does he have to give us? He has to give us and promise us and bring forth a body that doesn't have any of these things. And he did that by the resurrection from the dead. Now, Jesus was raised from the dead and born from the dead, basically, as, as you can see, uh, the scripture says. Now, with that in mind, I want to go to 1 Peter. And we're going to look at 1 Peter here. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. It says here, <clears throat> let me read from, sorry, let me read from verse 3. It says, <clears throat> Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ from the dead. Okay, now, we have been begotten again 
unto a living hope. So what he is saying is, is we, before Jesus came, we had the expectation that we have to live by the law. That's what man thought. Man had the expectation that by the sweat of his brow and human ability, he has to try and attain unto eternal life, to live and not die. That is what man was trying. He was trying, if you go and look at every, all, all the nations of the world, the greatest thing is the fight for survival. That's what it is, to live and not die. That's how technology is formed, because of man's desire to live and not die. That is what it's all about. So man was, when Adam sinned, man was born unto the expectation of death by his own ability. Adam was made by God, but when Adam believed the lie, man was now begotten unto the expectation of death by his own works. But now in the resurrection of Jesus, God has now come and given a new hope to humanity. For he has conquered our sin and death. And now this message of the resurrection, as we believe upon this message, we find that we are now born from this truth. And we have a life today that is born from holding to the head the resurrected Jesus. So it says here, He has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. For those of you that want to think of universalism and those kind of things, I want to just say go and study First Peter in its context. You will see he's talking about the believer here. It's not talking about all people. It's talking about the believer. Yet we find that Christ is unto all, but upon those who believe. Because um, I know I'm going to get endless emails saying, well, Betty, the whole world is born again. The whole world is not born again. Jesus was the only begotten. Only begotten is written in John chapter 3. It's written 50 years after Jesus. It's, it's like, you know, and now he says the only begotten. He has given unto us the only begotten. So there's one begotten, and that is Jesus. And those who believe upon him will not perish, but have everlasting life. They are now born from this life when they believe upon him. That is very simple. So then it goes on in verse 4. It says here that he, uh, we have been begotten unto new and lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you who are, and now it talks about us, uh, we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now church, this is now when I get to the crux of it and, and I think we'll, we'll head into this for the next 10 minutes. The reason why I preach this to you is not because I try to have a new revelation on what it means to be born again or anything like that or try to be controversial. The reason why I preach this unto you is because it is the power of God. It is the power of God which will nourish you with peace today, which will nourish you with love in your heart for your neighbor which will bring forth contentment in your heart. Why, why do I want you to have contentment? Why does God want me to have contentment? Why does God want us to have these things? Do you know why? Because if you discontent, if you're not content, let's use finances for example, you will destroy your own life with a lust for more. You will bring terror to those around you because of that thing that drives you all the time. You need to be set, and I need to be set free from fear. God wants us free from fear, free from the torture of this world, and all those kind of things. And how is God going to get that right? He's going to take one man, raise him from the dead, that man's death, and sin that he had had to include us, so that we can now have the promise 
of the resurrection and now be born from that promise. Glory to God. Have a new life because of a new hope. That is how it works. Now he says here, let me read verse 4 again. 1 Peter 1 verse 4, To an inheritance incorruptible is begotten us again unto a lively hope. So we are begotten, we have new lives because we are now expecting to have a new birth of our bodies wherein we will be raised from the dead. As we accepted this and believed upon this, this Spirit of God that would raise, that raised Christ from the dead has already now entered our hearts. And now we are increasing with the very increase of God. That's now what's happening. That's why you live a holy life. It's not because, well, I must live a holy life, otherwise God cannot forgive me and God cannot bless me. And the, No, no, no. We live a holy life because He's blessed us. And we don't decide to live the holy life. We believe upon the resurrection and from there God lives the holy life in us. It's not us who live, but Christ, the rulership of God over sin and death, living in us. That's what it's about. So now it goes on, it says here, that we have been begotten unto a new and lively hope by the resurrection. So I am now, as Adam sinned and man was now born unto that expectation, have had his life organized according to that, I now, and you who believe in the Lord, we, as we believe in this hope of the resurrection, as we have faith, a persuasion that we shall also be raised, our lives are now revolving around that truth. And that spirit of that truth is now inside us and brings this brand new life forth in us. I hope you understand. Now it says in verse 5 here, or verse 4, that this lively hope is an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and fades not away, reserved in heaven for us who are kept, us who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. That's ready to be real in the last times. That word kept there means to guard, to protect by military guard, either to prevent hostile invasion or to keep the inhabitants of a besieged city from flight, metaphorically, under the control of the Mosaic law, that he might not escape from its power. So what he's saying here is, we are kept under the control of God by having hope of the bodily new birth or the resurrection. As we hope this, God keeps us. That is what that passage is saying. Now, verse 6 says, In this resurrection we greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. So he says here, we are kept by God, yet we can be in heaviness. He says you've got great joy in the midst of heaviness. Why? Because even when the heaviness comes, God keeps us, guards us, and keeps us under the control of His resurrection life as we have a confident expectation of the new birth of our bodies in the resurrection. As we believe upon this, the Spirit of God inside us brings forth a life that's robust and strong in this world wherein we have holiness and kindness and love and all those things. Can you see how holiness and love and kindness is not a command, but a fruit and a result of an expectation that we have in God? Now I want to end off with this. I mean, I'm not even halfway through what I've planned to say, but Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the good news that Jesus was raised from the dead, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. 
to the Jew first and also for the, to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it's written, the just shall live and not perish or have eternal life in their bodies by faith. Now, this passage, and you will see in the Facebook description that I said, this was a passage that I was thinking about for many, many years, and I believe I've come to understand this about two weeks ago for the first time, about a week and a half ago. This is what it says, that in the good news that Jesus was raised from the dead, and this is going to bless you, because I'm going to explain to you what it means where the Bible says, uh, from faith to faith, from faith to faith. And this is what it means. For in the message that Christ was raised from the dead, the good news of Christ, the salvation power of God, is revealed in the believer from faith to faith, as it's written, the just shall live, and I want to use my own words here, and not die by believing in Jesus or having faith. Now, what is from faith to faith? Very simple. The gospel is preached, and when Jesus was raised from the dead, people had faith that he was raised. But this faith that they had that he was raised produced a faith in them, a persuasion in them, that they shall also be raised. In other words, it's from faith he was raised unto the faith that I will be raised. So the just shall have life by having faith in the resurrected Jesus and what we can be persuaded of will take place in the future, which is our resurrection, which is our bodily new birth. <laughs> Glory to God. And the beautiful thing is, as we believe upon this, we have received the seal of the Holy Spirit, or the Bible says the down payment or the proof of the Holy Spirit, that we shall be made immortal. In other words, when we have the Holy Spirit, it is the seal of our salvation. In other words, it is the down payment or the proof of payment that we shall, in future, be saved from our physical death and have a body born from the dead, wherein Jesus is the firstborn amongst many brethren who should be born in their physical bodies, into immortality. And as we believe upon this truth, we are now born again from this truth in having a brand new life unto the hope of the resurrection. Glory to God. You will, if you've listened carefully, you'll see there's three stages there, but we will get into that next week. I trust that this is food for thought. This is the power of God unto salvation. We, the Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 12, that those who have accepted him, he has given unto them the right to be called the sons of God, for they now are not owing their birth anymore to their earthly fathers and mothers, ethnicity or the law, but their birth is now of God. Why? Because they believed upon Jesus. And what would the end of that be? The end of that would be the manifestation of that eternal life. Let me use one more example, and this, this will bless you. If I, in South Africa, they had this thing now called the expropriation of land without compensation, and it did strike and still striking fear in a lot of people's hearts because what is happening is <clears throat> there is a change. They, they proposed a change of law wherein certain acts in our constitution will be changed so that basically any property can be taken from you by the government if they should see need for it without paying you for it. That is, that's the kind of thing. And the main focus is farmland. Now, 
When that law gets changed, and this is the example I used uh, explaining to my son, in, is both of my sons in the car on the way back from the church service we had this morning. When, when that law, when that law is not changed, even if it's a threat, it, it, it's actually nothing. But once that law is changed, you find that the whole of South Africa has now become new. Yet, it's going to need people to believe in that law so that that law can be implemented. And then we will find our lives when we hear, say you're a property owner, you're a farm farmer, you will have, once that law is changed, and you have got the expectation that your farm is going to be taken, you will now have a life born from that expectation, and you will have been begotten again unto a condemning hope. And you will have a life now born from the truth of the change of that law. But yet you will have a farm. You might still farm on that farm for 25 years or 30 years. And then once that farm is taken from you, then you will now have received the fullness, the full glory <laughs> of that law. But in the meantime, you were begotten of that hope as you believed upon that. And I hope you see what I am saying here. As we believe, as Jesus was raised from the dead, there was a change of law. Those who believe upon this law are begotten again unto a hope. What is this hope? This hope is the, the, uh, the belief of being born, physically born from the dead. This belief already gives unto us a new life now, but in the last day we will see the fullness of what we are born of today manifest. That's how it works. Glory to God. If you just say, Lord, I want to understand this, and I want to have a life born from this, I want to tell you the Lord will open up your, your mind to understand this as He is busy opening up my mind to see this, and as I am experiencing the power that's born from this truth. Glory to God.